Welcome to the AMATIC 2015 webinar series incorporating the use of real data and R in a statistics course with Kelly Fitzpatrick and this presentation is sponsored by the Joint Committee of AMATIC and the American Statistical Association or ASA. AMATIC is the American Mathematical Association of two-year colleges and our core value is building expertise and exhibiting leadership in the teaching and learning of mathematics, enhancing personal growth, and improving teaching methods and effectiveness as a personally initiated lifelong responsibility. And for more information, please visit our website at amatic.org. And please note that the views expressed by the presenter are not necessarily the views of AMATIC and any commercial products mentioned by presenters are not endorsed by AMATIC. And WebAssign is proud to support the AMATIC webinar series. So now we're going to... Thank you, John, for the introduction. I'd like to thank John and Mary DeHart for inviting me to do this webinar today. Um, and when the slides come up, we can start the presentation. I uh, just, just want to introduce myself. I'm an assistant professor here at the County College of Morris, which is in Randolph, New Jersey, northern New Jersey. And I first was introduced to R when I was a graduate student at Columbia University. Uh, it was a program that they used really exclusively in three departments, the mathematics department, the economics department, and the statistics department. Uh, and that's really where I fell in love with using this software package. Um, so I will start the presentation. And my contact information is below. It's kfitzpatrick at ccm.edu if you ever want to contact me after the webinar. Uh, this is a nice quote that I like to always start off with from uh, Val, or Hal Varen, the chief economist of Google. He really makes a nice statement about how having the ability to analyze data and make sense of all of the information we are now overwhelmed with that we can really download off the internet and being able to analyze that data and make sense of this data is an important skill set that a lot of our students really need starting from the elementary level to the high school level and then to the college level. The department here um, at the County College of Morris has taken the initiative to integrate statistical software into most of our statistics courses here at the college and we really feel that the by having our students use software it will enhance their education and it will prepare them for the real world and for uh, future goals or educational goals that they have. This was an interesting idea from Thomas Edison uh, that he talked about in 1913 when the motion picture was introduced. He really thought that that was going to change the traditional classroom setting as far as having a professor lecturing up at the board and the students sitting in their chairs listening to the lecture. But that really didn't happen. Um, we still today do the traditional lecture, the professor up at the board, the students sitting and listening. And we really ask ourselves, this time around, will technology change the classroom? And will our students learn more by introducing technology into the classroom? I first want to talk about five reasons, or there's actually multiple reasons why to use R. And I want to go over those first. Then I'll go over how to download and install R. And then I will go over projects that I like to introduce to my class. The top three, these are the top five reasons why I personally like to use R over other software packages such as Excel, Minitab, um, and I've never really used SAS or um, other packages, but I've used Excel and Minitab. Uh, the reason why R is so powerful is that you can control a large data set with one identifier. You have full control over formatting and design. Um, it's open source code. Uh, it brings numbers and concepts to life for the students. And computer programming is an actually an ad a desired skill set. So when you open up the R console for the first time, it's a prompt and a command line, and you will actually type code into the command line. Uh, because I do teach at the two-year college, and the level of the students is at the two-year college, I don't ever expect my students to produce the code themselves. I actually always give them the code for the projects and then they always need to 
edit the code in a few places or I will just give them the code and they just type practice typing it into the console to see the results they get. Um, maybe if you're at a four-year university that's when I would expect the students to maybe have some skill sets where they would actually produce the, the code and the programming on their own. Uh, to download R or to go to R, uh, the website, the web address is below uh, www.r project.org. Three fiscal reasons to use R is that it's actually free for the students to download. It's free for the professors to download. It's free for the college to implement. Uh, just one thing, if you do download R in a classroom setting, it cannot be pushed from the back end to the front. Um, it actually has to be installed locally on each machine in the classroom. So here at the County College of Morris, if I'm going to a computer lab to use R, I will just ask the help desk or our IT department to make sure that R is installed and they will just send a college intern to go install it locally onto the computers. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? I think these fiscal reasons um, are very important and I've even heard um, other colleges you know have stopped using Minitab or other programs that actually require fees, um, upgrade fees, um, where R is free. So that's a huge advantage. So if students need to work on projects at home, they're able to do that because the software is free. Uh, my class sessions are either an hour long or an hour and 15 minutes long. And they meet either, the ones that have computer components in them are actually four credit classes. Um, sometimes those usually meet three times a week for an hour. Um, I actually teach the honor statistics course here and the honor statistics course was redesigned that we have two class periods in lecture for an hour and I wrote a lab book in R and one hour of class session a week is going to the computer lab actually producing projects in R. We actually had Siemens Healthcare Diagnostics come to campus uh, this past semester and these are three reasons why they stated they actually use R when they're doing research and development. R has less reporting requirements to the FDA. Analysis is easily reproducible in R. And R is actually faster when analyzing um, data. We have two semesters, yes, per year fall and spring semester. That, that's our semester system, someone was asking. Um, these are resources for training in R. Uh, I actually picked up a textbook. I think that's one of the best ways if you've never programmed in R or haven't used the software. I would recommend picking up a book. Um, this is the book that I happen to pick up, Data Analysis and Graphics Using R, an example-based approach um, that has very good examples to use. These are online classes in R. You could go to Code School. Would I, I would recommend Code School for a beginner um, in programming in R. Actually, I actually make some of my students go to school, Code School and do the mini course. It would, wouldn't take longer than a weekend to complete it. Uh, Coursera also has a lot of programming classes in R, and those are actually offered by uh, Roger Pang and Jeff Leake out of John Hopkins University, the biostatistics team there. And those courses are more for an advanced programmer. You should be familiar with uh, floating variables or how to pass floating variables when programming. And you should be familiar with, let's say, um, nested for loops and statements like that. Um, but actually, uh, the Coursera course um, that they offer um, is very, very well done. R actually also has built in tutorials for help and built-in manuals for help. You would just go to the help icon and download those manuals for help. This is um, what it looks like when you go to www.r projectorg This is the initial homepage and you would, I circled in red where you need to click. So I found these pages, there's a lot of writing on them and it may not be so clear where to, where you need to actually click. So you would click on download R, which I highlighted on this slide. Then actually a lot of countries contribute to this software and you would just scroll down to the United States of America 
and select one of these colleges and this would you would just be pulling data I guess from these local from these colleges I actually just select Berkeley or UCLA is fine I usually just select one of the, the top ones actually it's interesting too if you actually take one I took the uh, Coursera course through R and it's really interesting to see who else is in your class because the discussion board is full of people um, but it's not just full of people from the United States it was very it's a very interesting experience because there are people from around the entire world taking these courses um, you will see contributions from Russia China India France um, so R is very very popular um, throughout the world. Then you would hit download R, whether you're downloading to a Mac, um, a Linux system, or Windows. So select one of those three choices. And then you would hit install R for the first time, which I've highlighted. And then I think from there you pretty much could walk through the steps clicking next, next, next. So I'd like everyone to write down and pick five numbers between 1 to 100. So take a few seconds to do that. Maybe you can write them into the chat room. There we go. Okay. I'll wait till everyone has typed in their numbers. It's always interesting to see how people type them in sets, whether you list them from high to low or not. Usually if you I pick five numbers, I'm going to pick 3, 10, 24, 29, and 33. So John, do we want to ask the first survey question? Uh, I'm really interested to know, did anyone select the birthday or age? And I think we have that on a, <clears throat> so if you could answer yes or no, and you don't have to hit select, just move your cursor over the yes, no, or no vote. So we have 19 participants, 17 people. Okay, there, I think that's everyone answering. Okay, so 80% of you said no and 19% said yes. Okay, can we go to the next poll question? Did anyone select a lucky number? My lucky number has to be happens to be 33, so I always select that number whenever I'm asked to pick random numbers. So again, it's 76 no, 23 yes. And can we ask the next question? Did anyone select the sports player's number, their team number, when they were, if they played sports? Okay, so that's a 94% no and a 6% yes. Okay, so a few people have selected. If you actually do this in your class, this is an interesting way to introduce simple random sampling. And you'll actually find that many of your students, when asked to select numbers um, at random, will actually tend to be biased. They will actually select, you know, their birthdays of their children or parents or loved ones they'll actually select their lucky number or they will actually select a sports player's name. So I have two young children. Um, my daughter was born on December 29th, so I have to pick 29. Uh, my birthday is on the 24th and my son was born on May 10th. Um, and 3 and 33 have always been my lucky numbers. Um, so I would, uh, it's interesting if you do this uh, with your students because they'll be surprised how did you know you I selected a lucky number or a birthday or you know, then you get to learn what teams or what sports teams your students are interested in. But this is always the first exercise I do because then I like to tell my students this is really why we go to the computer. The computer is going to eliminate the human bias to selection and the computer is the best choice to get a random sample. 
And this is always the first introduction I do or the first exercise I do with my students is we will go to R and we will enter in the code below. So in the next following slides, I will walk through the projects that I actually do with my classes. So I've explained why we use R, the advantages, what I, the advantages why I think R is useful in the classroom, and then I explained how to download R, where to access R, and now the remainder of the session, I would like to go over the actual projects I do in my classroom. Uh, the R code is very simple. You would enter this at the command line. You would enter choose 10 comma 5, and then you would select a simple random sample from there without uh, replacement equals false. Um, when you're typing in R, spelling and capitalization matter. So false and true always need to be capitalized. Um, sometimes in R you will need to download from the library. Um, I always, here you'll see the code says library G tools. And what that actually is doing, you can think of it as the computer is going or taking a book out of the library. And the reason why I need to do that or run that line of code that says library G tools is because I'm running the function combinations. And combinations is in that book at the library. Um, that's how I always explain it to my classes. So we can run combinations and also get all. So you have to be careful too with the size limitation. So if you run, um, here I limited the sample size to 20 now, and I'm only selecting five numbers from 20. And that will give you all the combinations. And that's a nice thing to do to show your students all the combinations of possible outcomes. So let's go to the next survey question. Um, in the movie Moneyball, does anyone remember what the key statistic was to determine a player's value? So I'm going to select that survey question and see if any, if you remember what the answer is, if anyone is a fan of the movie Moneyball. So 60% say on base percentage about. 18 say team batting average, and about 25 to 30% say home runs. So the actual answer is it was on base percentage. That was the key statistic that the movie Moneyball talked about. Um, it was very interesting. My husband wanted to watch the movie one night, and I thought it was just another baseball movie with Brad Pitt. Um, I was very surprised that it was actually more a movie about statistics statistical analysis and how statistics really change the world of baseball. So this is a nice project to do in your class, a correlation matrix. It's usually an extension on the concept of correlation. Instead of just computing the correlation coefficient between two variables, um, I found myself very early on getting bored just teaching that. Um, so this introduction of a correlation matrix and showing your students how you can analyze multiple variables at once was much more interesting for me and for my students. So you could actually run and upload a correlation matrix in R very easily with these three lines of code. The first line of code is data. Data is what I'm actually calling the information that I've uploaded into R. And I'm reading a CSV file and you would just type in the path of the file that I've actually stored the baseball data in. Um, if anyone ever wants access to these files, just email me and I'm more than happy to share that, those files with you. The next line of code you would run, um, again, the naming function is before the less than sign. So you could really name that, the, that information anything. Then I, I name it baseball correlation matrix and COR is the function that I'm using and I'm taking the data in columns 2 to 8. And the reason why I'd exclude one from that is because one is the information of the names, winning percentage, team batting average, on-base percentage. And I actually, you know, then you would get non-numeric and you would get an error in R if you were trying to run a correlation matrix on non-numeric data. So that's why I have to take the data from two to, to eight. And then actually you can export this file very easily in R with the write function. So I use write.csv. Uh, the, cor the baseball correlation matrix, that's where this matrix is stored in R, and I could just export that to the file path that I choose. Um, 
So this is interesting. Um, this is what I like to do with my students. We just go down the column of winnings percent, and I ask them what has the highest correlation to winnings percent, uh, positive correlation, and they see that it is runs scored. And then I ask them to look down the column of runs scored and see what has the highest correlation to runs scored. And through discovery, students realize it is on base percentage that has the highest correlation to runs scored. It's also a nice exercise to introduce the correlation matrix to students just to familiarize them with the properties of a matrix. Uh, this happens to be a square matrix where the rows and columns will always be the same. Uh, properties that the matrix is symmetric um, is interesting to explain to your students and also explain to them why the di diagonal of the correlation matrix is always one. So those uh, lead to some nice discussion even though we don't do um, you know, matrix mathematics in the statistics courses and it's not a requirement. I think it's just a nice way to display um, information um, with multiple variables. Any questions on the correlation matrix in R? There's actually a really nice web page um, from a Harvard professor. If you just Google math movies, uh, you can see that the uh, the prof there's uh, the link will go to this professor's web page, and he actually has some nice clips from the movie Moneyball, and he has actually a really nice archive of math movies um, that he has permission to use. Now I wanted to look at how to do graphs in R. Uh, this is a simple stem and leaf plot. The title is Snowfall in New York City from 1990 to 2013. And this is how you would enter information in R. It's just data equals, you need the C there. The C stands for combine or concatenate data. And this is entering the data in R. You could either enter it this way, or you can enter it and upload it, like I showed you through the uh, read.csv format. And you just simply type stem data and scale equals two, and you will get the stem and leaf plot. The data for snowfall is actually from the National Weather Service. The National Weather Service actually provides a lot of nice data and free information uh, for weather in New York City. It has snowfall, it has temperatures in New York City, it has temperatures for New Year's Eve, it has temperatures for all the holidays. Oh, thank you, John, for the link. That is the link to the, the Harvard professor's webpage. It's, it's very, very nice. Uh, graphs in R. Uh, this is the first line of code. I want to just go over with this with you. Uh, R is one of the only has a great graphing um, capabilities, which makes it superior than its competitors, I would say. Um, that's one of the ad huge advantages of using R, is the graphing capabilities are amazing. Uh, the first thing I wrote is PAR, which partitions the graphing console. And here I partitioned it into having two rows and two columns. And you could do, uh, I do normality plots, and I do like 12 by 2 or 12 by 12, and do little quizzes for my students. The first line, of, the next line of code is histogram, and you just enter the data, which is the snowfall from New York City, which I call data. Again, this is an example of where you're controlling data with one identifier. Uh, here I just did breaks equals 10, and then you could do the probability distribution where you just say prop equals capital true, and that's the next graph. The box plot is the next graph, and you can see I said main equals title, which will put in the title snowfall in New York City from 1990 to 2013. And you can change horizontal equals true which changes it just from a horizontal display. I think it defaults to the vertical display, the box and whisker plots. And the next plot, which you sometimes have to play around with the x-axis, is the strip chart that will actually give you the dot plots. And you sometimes have to do a little formatting with that as far as the x-axis. I don't think the package someone's asking, it's not named, I do, don't believe it's named R after regression or correlation coefficient. Um, I'm not actually sure how it got the name R. So this is a nice graph in R. You could just do the normality plots on the snowfall in New York City just by running one line of code, QQ norm, enter in the data, and this is, um, 
data, putting the actual data on the x-axis equals true, which is a way a lot of the textbooks teach this. And I'd like to ask the last question, survey question, if you could let me know subjectively, um, determine if this, nor this plot or the snowfall in New York City is actually normally distributed. And I always really tend not to like to ask my students um, the subjective analysis for normality because sometimes they really have trouble visualizing whether the data points do or do not fall in a nice straight line. So let's say 75% say yes, and 25% say no. OK, thank you, John. So really, maybe some of the questions you're asking yourself when you're looking at this plot is, is the point to the far right an outlier or not? Is that far enough away from the right to be an outlier or to cause the distribution to be non-normal? Maybe some of you are looking at and saying in the middle or slightly to the left, there may be some curvature in the data. And this really is one of the advantages to R. A lot of the data analysis packages out there will produce this as the normality plot. I actually like to write my own code for the normality plots because I like to add more of the objective analysis and looking at the correlation coefficients between the data and the normal scores. Uh, I can add the Shapiro ratio and I can actually get the length or how many observations there are. So let's take a look at that. And who's right or wrong, actually it's dependent. So I guess everybody gets this one right because the actual answer is, well, it depends on what we set alpha to be. This is a great example where it does depend if we set alpha to be 10%, 5%, or 1%. Um, so this is a nice way that I like to use normality plots in R, is that if you look at the code above in the box, um, NSQNorm gives me the normal scores. I need to get those for the length of data I have, which is 24 data points. Then I'm going to run um, the correlation between the actual data and the normal scores. And I really stress to my students the importance of mapping this data or doing the mapping properly. It's one of the key words in the second line of code is the word sort. Leaving that word out will actually change the results drastically. Um, and sometimes that's a very good quest test question. I will uh, show them this code. I will show them the graph. And the really the error with the code and the error with the graph is that I didn't do the mapping properly. I haven't sorted the data from low to high to map it properly with the normal scores, which are, you know, range from negative 2 to plus 2 in this case, or sometimes negative 3 to plus 3. It leads to a really in good test question, I think. Um, how would you test your students using R or the software? <clears throat> and then here I actually draw the plot of the sorted data and the normal scores. And then I add the three lines of text to this data. So this is the advantage of R. I don't think um, Excel or I'm not sure if Minitab can, can easily add this information to the graph. Um, but I think R provides a nice easy way to do that. So I've actually included three lines of data on this plot. I've included the number of observations being 24. I provided the correlation coefficient between the data and the normal scores and the Shapiro ratio or the Shapiro p-value. And here we can see, um, here I provided you also with the critical values from the, nor the, the table. And you can see that at 10% the data is not normally distributed, which is also corresponds to what the Shapiro test tells us. At 5% the data is normally distributed. And at 1%, the data is also normally distributed. So we get the same answer whether we obviously look at the critical value test or the Shapiro test. But I always like to have my students really do more the objective analysis and do that critical value test. I think this is a nice extension. Some textbooks don't cover the critical value test um, at the entry level um, of teaching statistics in the classroom. But I think it leads to a more 
well, a better answer and a more accurate answer than just asking them if they subjectively think the data falls in a nice straight line. Are there any questions on the normality plots in R? Okay. <laughs> so the next slide I would like to go over with you or talk to you about is um, I've actually parsed the data up and thank you. Uh, any questions? I'm just looking to see if there's any questions. Okay. <clears throat> This is interesting. Um, again, I've downloaded real data. Um, I, if you actually take the time to read the report from the American Statistics Association, the Gaze Report, I actually read it, I've read it several times. Um, it offers a lot of great advice for teaching statistics. Um, of those, of, they have six main recommendations, and this, this conversation or this webinar really covers two of those main topics. The first one being to use real data in your classrooms. Uh, my students were here in New Jersey, so they find it interesting to look at information from New York City. They also suggested, or the Gaze Report also recommended, to use technology in the classroom. So of the six main recommendations, this presentation highlights or covers two of those recommendations. Again, to use real data in your classrooms and to use technology in your classrooms. So just looking at th these three different plots, in R, which can be run very quickly, you can see that uh, the snowfall from 1869 to 2012 is actually not normally distributed. That outlier is actually far enough away from the rest of the observations to make it not normally distributed at a 10, 5, and 1 percent level of significance. If we look at just the data from 1990 to 1999, we can see that it's clearly not normally distributed. And maybe students would get this answer more correct if they were asked to subjectively interpret the data. And then if we look at the data from 20, uh, year 2000 to year 2012, we can see that, yes, in fact, the data is normally distributed. So it's nice to say or to tell your students just because you look at a particular data set, it doesn't mean that if you look at different genres or different time periods, you're going to get the same answer. So I think it's nice for them to see that. That's why when you become more of an expert in your field of study, you have to con constantly be running the analysis because over time periods, things change. Um, correlations and relationships uh, change over time. Uh, distributions change over time. And I think it leads to a nice discussion as maybe why do things change over time? Um, and to look at different time periods. Um, the point of, of interest here is actually the snowfall in 1995 was the year that we had the most snowfall in New York City and we had about 76 inches of snow. So some of your students would actually be born in 1995. So again, it's relating the information and data back to your student um, and then they'll find be more interested in your lectures. So this data set for the snowfall, again, is from the National Weather Service. Their, their website can be very um, hard to maneuver. Um, I actually have a page write-up of where I get data from. So if you're interested in that write-up, I could send that to you. I actually use data from there. I use data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And I use a lot to get the unemployment rates and CPI rates, which is that information is very easily downloaded off the web into Excel. Uh, where else? Do I, and I like to use, um, I come from finance. Actually, my background, I spent over 10 years on Wall Street uh, working in the financial industry. That's my background before I be, uh, came to academia. And uh, you can use Yahoo Finance um, to download stock prices and information like that for free, which ends up to be uh, interesting data analysis in your class. You, uh, sometimes I like to look at Facebook stock and Apple stock, or I have a class full of business majors, and they find it interesting to look at that data. Um, they find it interesting, you know, when the unemployment rate was running up close to 9%, 10%, it was an interesting time to be talking about that data in your classroom. Um, now I think it's hovering around... I want to say 5%, I could be wrong, um, but you know, it's more steady now and you know, you, you, weren't, you weren't at those extremes that you were maybe two years ago. 
This is a nice display of box and whisker plots where I actually um, analyze the data by decade. So you can go back from 1870s to uh, 2000, and students can see that different decades um, result in different shapes of different distributions, different means. Uh, some distributions have outliers, or some time periods have outliers, and some do not. And you can see, again, that point really stands out in 1995 when there was 76 inches of snowfall. Oh, so someone was talking about, let's go back one, how would you determine visually that the left graph is not normally just big? I actually looked up the critical values on the chart. So I actually looked up and compared the critical value of 0.9818 to the critical values on the table. And um, so that's how I determined it. I didn't determine it visually. I actually used the critical value from the chart, which would produce an R, and I compared it to the critical values in the table. Um, so you can't really determine it visually. You have to do the comparison with the table. I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> you know, that's why I like to give the students the critical value, because on the test, you would probably get, you know, answers that, yes, this is normally distributed. It's sometimes hard to make that subjective analysis. Um, and I found myself not liking that on the test, where, right, sometimes subjectively, you could really answer either way if your eye isn't really trained in actually reading normality plots or in the data or information that you're looking at. So this is hypothesis testing in R. Um, it can be done very easily. And I wanted to determine at a 5% level of significance if the average snowfall from 1990 to 2013 is different than the historical average from 1869 to 18, or from, from 1869 to 1989, which was 28 inches a year. So doing hypothesis testing is where we really end our semester. And this can be done very easily, or running tests in R can be done very quickly, really in just one line of code. Um, so it's just t.test. You would enter your data, which is I called data in this case. The alternative is where you're going to enter whether it's a left tail test, a right tail test, or a two tail test. And here R uses C, and you have to have the quotes. It's two sided. Uh, I forget it, what they, I think it's less than for a left tail test and right or greater than for the, the other test. Um, you could always just use Google t-test in R, and that will give you actually the syntax and all of the information that needs to be put into the function to output, to get the output that you need. Here we would set the mu to be 28, and confidence level here is 95%. So if you look at the output, I really just highlighted where what's important um, mainly when you're looking at these tests, is the p-value. And here, very, very quickly, students could make the judgment that if the p-value is less than alpha, they're going to reject the null. In this case, we would not reject the null hypothesis, and we can conclude that the average yearly snowfall from the time period we tested, 1990 to 2013, is not really different than the historical mean. Yes, so John provided the, the, the choices for the alternative hypothesis. It's two-sided and then less and then greater. Thank, thank you, John, for that. A lot of times if you get stuck and you find yourself wanting to do something in R, if you just Google it, um, that's one of the best ways to learn R, is give yourself a little project and actually look at other people's source code. Um, that's how really I learned R, is by looking at other people's code, copying their code, and seeing what happens. Uh, if you take the class at Coursera, that's their recommendation as well. If you get stuck, if you don't understand something, you Google t-test in R, and you will get a lot of good information from the internet. Are there any other questions on hypothesis testing? We've covered graphing in R. We've covered simple random sampling, downloading combinations, reading and writing files. So I'll just give you a few minutes to type in. <coughs> uh, two sample tests. Um, if you, 
I don't, I could just send you the code. You would just type in two sample te uh, tests. And I think you would just use the same line of command, t-test, and then it would ask you whether you would enter two sets of data. You would enter in data, comma, and then another set of data. Yeah, we don't do the two sample tests at our intermediate or at our beginner level at the two-year college. Um, but, you know, R has all of the, t like a lot of testing that you could do, whether you're testing the standard deviation, Okay, so I'll go on to the last slide. This is a nice project. This is a simulate. Let's just see if there's one. Is the package off? Yes, I do use R um, at the basic level. Um, I, and I always give them the code. That's the important thing, though. I never make my students produce this code by themselves. So I would go over, say, the t tests in class, and then maybe give them a few, and then give them the code, explain how to input all the variables into the code, and then I would give them a small project where they would have to change the input variables. But again, I, at the two-year college and at the entry level, I would not expect the students to come up with the code themselves. Uh, we don't cover resampling now. Um, I also have other professors at the County College who are now on board with using R, and they are actually, you know, you start off slow, my recommendation would be, doing one or two projects a semester, and then as you build um, your experience working with R and working with the students, um, there is going to be, you know, a frustrating period on your time, because as you're growing and learning, but your students are also growing and learning too at the same time. Um, but you just have to be patient with yourself and also patient with the students. And you know, I've been doing this probably for five years now. And um, you know, now I've built up a portfolio of projects that I'm able to do with my class. And John provided us, yeah, t-test, that's right. You would enter, like I said, you would enter the x data set, and then you would enter the y values as for the second data set. But it defaults to y is null in this case, because I've only entered one data set. Um, R is a great place to do simulations and introduce simulations to your students. So this is the classic, the next slide is the classic textbook simulation of tossing a coin three times and actually analyzing the output. So here I've uh, included the theoretical probabilities, <coughs> excuse me, and the theoretical frequencies. But obviously it's nice for students to see that theoretically it says I would get the probability of zero would mean I'm getting no uh, heads in this case 12 and a half times and that, and that could never happen. We, when we look at the simulated frequencies we see that we can never get a 0.5. So it's interesting to compare theoretically what I'm supposed to get against what the simulated frequency has done and if anyone wants the code for the simulation um, I actually used binary um, random sampling between zeros and ones. One a zero represented the tail one represented the head, and then I added up that column of outcomes, and that was very easy to do in R using binary code to represent the simulation of heads tails. Um, and here I put in the red lines to represent where the theoretical frequencies are, or the theoretical prop probabilities in the second graph, and you could see and compare graphically where your th theoretical values are versus your simulated frequencies. And you can see that sometimes you're going to be over and sometimes you're going to be under. So, right, they're never all going to be over and they're never all going to be under. So I think that's interesting to explain to your class. Um, I make them run this for 100 trials. And then they have to, I give them the code and they have to edit the code. So they would rerun the simulation for 500 trials and they would do the same comparison. They would compare the theoretical frequencies against the simulated frequencies and the empirical uh, probabilities. And then they would do the same thing at a thousand trials and they would do the comparison. And then they would really have to talk about which simulation was closest to the theoretical frequencies or the theoretical probabilities. So it's a nice exercise to do in the computer lab or it's a nice exercise to do as a take home project. But I think it's nice to introduce students at the beginner level or the introductory level to simulations in statistical analysis.
yes, um, so someone asked about feedback. I can also provide you with my feedback. Um, I'm actually now keeping a list of my students' comments um, on my SOR reports um, about how they actually really enjoyed using R in class. And um, some of them have actually, um, so I had a student in my honor statistics class went on to Rutgers, a four-year uh, college in New Jersey, and then he had to use SAS. Um, but having an experience using R or programming at the two-year college really helped him when he went on and moved to the four-year college. Um, so a lot of our students do transfer um, to really good four-year universities. And I feel having the experience programming, working with software, and working with the computer helps them when they go on to the next level. Um, I have feedback. Actually, it's also interesting from all different majors. So from nursing majors, from computer science majors, from business majors, from liberal arts majors, I find that no matter what their majors are, um, they all enjoy working with the programs. Because a lot of my examples I try to vary between, you know, business analysis, you know, weather analysis or simulation, there really is something for everyone, or sports statistics. Uh, the next question is, I think everyone can read the questions. <coughs> so, does it matter, students always like to ask that question, does it matter whether I have one coin and I toss it three times and look at the outcome, or if I have three different coins and I toss it once. So it doesn't specify between the two scenarios. But the outcome and the way it's looked in the binary outcome, I would say you have one, well, it doesn't matter, I would say, would be my answer. Right, because your one trial is the flip of three outcomes, whether that be one coin tossed three times or three coins tossed once. Yes, so regression analysis. Um, I didn't do a regression analysis example because um, I should have included that. <clears throat> um, but R um, uses the function, the tilde and then LM standing for linear model. And then you would just write that. And that would be, here I could write it here for you. It would be this tilde. You would use linear model. And then you would do, oh no, you would do, I'm sorry, you would do uh, regression. Regression. A linear model. Then you would do your X value, or no, your Y values. I think it's tilde your X values. And then some information. And that's the line of code for the linear model in regression. And then you would just call summary, whatever you called regression, and that would produce the ANOVA table. So in two lines of code, you can run the regression, and then you could look at the output in summary. Uh, we don't do ANOVA analysis at the entry level. We do it in our second level course. Um, but it is nice. We do the regression identity. Um, so it is nice if you are covering the regression identity to relate it to the ANOVA table because then they can see um, just the relationship uh, SST equals SSR plus SSE, <coughs> which they can get off the ANOVA table. So maybe I will do that, but only in my honors class while I introduce the ANOVA table, but I'll only show them how it relates to the regression identity. And I don't go any further on than that because we don't do the F tests. We don't look at the, uh, the, the F value. Um, are there any more questions? This was my last slide. At this point, have you? <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I don't use the graphing calculator um, at all in any of my classes. It's not a requirement, and I don't teach the graphing calculator. Um, the way our classrooms are designed here at the County College of Morris is we have a nice podium with a computer on it, and all of our classrooms have the podium and R installed on it. So when I'm lecturing, I can bring up R simultaneously with them, and some of them have R on their laptops in class, or I use R in the computer lab. So I actually don't use the graphing calculator. Um, I actually found for myself that I only used the graphing calculator when I was in college and in graduate school. And then when I worked in finance for years, I used Excel and R. But I never found myself using the graphing calculator outside of academia.
Yes, uh, you can have copies of my slide. I'm sure John will um, send them to you. And thank you for attending uh, today's webinar. And I will just stay on for the remainder of the time we have if anyone has any questions or comments. Um, if anyone wants any of my data sets or any of, of this information, just please let me know. Thank you uh, for attending the webinar, and I hope you learned something, and I hope you uh, start programming in R. Thank you. All right, well, thanks again, Kelly. If all of you want to thank Kelly in the chat room, that would be great. And I see there's a couple more questions, but I think that we'll go through these uh, ending slides here so that everyone can have the uh, survey link and whatnot as well. So thanks for participating in today's AMATIC webinar. And if you'd like to support future AMATIC webinars, please consider becoming a member of AMATIC at bit.ly slash join dash AMATIC. And please remember to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash AMATIC. And recordings of past AMATIC webinars can be found at bit.ly slash AMATIC dash webinars. And it typically takes one to two weeks to produce and upload webinars to this archive. So that will include today's webinar as well. And please take two minutes to evaluate the webinar content in the presenter at bit.ly slash AMATIC30. And you can click right on the screen there to do that. And if you need email confirmation of your participation in this webinar, please fill in the optional section at the end of the evaluation. So uh, that's all that I have. But I want to give Kelly a minute or two here to go back and answer the questions that may have come up. Um, so when someone asked in finance if I use statistics, I actually um, did a lot of value at risk calculations, um, which is interesting for Lehman Brothers, who no longer exists. Um, so the value at risk calculations, really, we were looking at distributions and a lot of times in finance. And when we do analysis, we assume a normal distribution. Um, stock prices are not normally distributed, but we assume and make the assumption that stock returns are normally distributed. Or maybe we assume commodity returns are normally distributed when, in fact, they may not be. Um, and when we did value at risk analysis, we were looking at determining at that lower tail or at that 5% in that lower tail, what would the loss be to the firm? Um, so that, was, that did require statistical analysis to really come up with a number of, you know, if this is our portfolio, potentially how much could we lose or how much are we in danger of losing? Are there any other questions? And sometimes I would have to run statistical analysis for margin requirements. Um, I traded commodities. And in the commodity market, sometimes um, I traded cattle and oil uh, futures. And sometimes those markets were limit down uh, four or five days in a row. And your brokerage firm would be calling up asking for more margin or additional margin. And sometimes if you didn't want to post additional capital and you were able to quantitatively um, convince them that you didn't need to uh, produce additional capital or more than the uh, initial or margin requirements, um, that could be accepted. And that, that was a place where I actually did use uh, statistical analysis as well. And a lot of times, if you see how margin requirements are computed or calculated, um, you could just use some quick statistics to, to, to figure out how those requirements are determined. All right. Well, thanks again, Kelly. It looks like the questions may be winding down here. So I'm going to stop the recording here. But if uh, anyone wants to stick around, I'm sure Kelly won't mind an extra question or two. Thank you.